you so much for talking to us, talking to the Voice of America. You just came back from Uzbekistan, from Tajikistan. Was this your first time in, in your position? Yes, it was. And first of all, thank you. It's a pleasure to be doing this with VOA. Uh, it was my first uh, opportunity to visit Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. I went uh, to the region as part of our negotiations that we had in Almaty with Iran and then took the opportunity then to visit a couple of other countries. So yes, uh, I must say it was a great opportunity to get to know a little bit more about the region. What is public diplomacy? What is your role? Well, what we do and what my job is, is really to communicate America's foreign policy to the world and to the American people. We need to do this effectively, accurately, and really in today's 24-7 media environment with all the social media, we have to actually do it quickly. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to communicate, engage with foreign audiences so that they better understand what America's policies are, so that they better understand what American values are. So that's my job. And so we try to coordinate everything that we say publicly through our daily press brief things through our embassies around the world to make sure that we are uh, explaining very well what the United States is all about. Your office has been spending a great deal of energy and resources to be very active on social media, um, use the internet to, to engage young people in the region. Uh, why is that so important? Well, we do believe that we need to be in the platforms and the spaces where people are having their conversations. The reality is that today's youth is on Facebook. They're following Twitter. They're looking at YouTube. They're using Google+. If we're not there talking with them, they won't hear our perspective. The other thing is we don't want other people defining what the United States is about or telling people what they th say our policies are. We prefer that the people hear it directly from us, and it's really exciting. And now I was out in... Uh, Uzbekistan and our, through our embassy in Tashkent I did a Facebook chat where I got a number of really good questions and it's a way again to communicate with the youth in, in Tashkent, in Uzbekistan and others, I mean of all ages really that are becoming uh, so knowledgeable and want to be informed and are using uh, elements like Facebook, like YouTube, like Twitter to be uh, involved. What were the kinds of issues these young people were raising? As you know, both in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, internet is still um, controlled to a great extent. Well, you're right. I mean, people are concerned about access to the internet, the freedom of the internet, and that was something I spoke to, that it's really important in today's society and the American perspective, the U.S. government's perspective, is that you should have access to the internet and information should flow freely and talk about government transparency so people can get the information that they desire, can communicate amongst themselves. So clearly that is an issue I think that's very important to the youth who are very excited about being able to connect and have discussions and debate, which we think is a very healthy part of any democracy. We know that the Obama administration is cutting um, some assistance to the region. Um, should we be worried that there will be less and less exchange programs for the region? Well, I mean, we are under a difficult uh, resource issue here in the United States at the moment. As you're well aware, we have the sequester that's forcing us to look and cut uh, some programs. But you can rest assured that the United States is very committed to being engaged uh, in Central Asia. We do believe exchanges are critically important. People get to connect and get to better understand each other. It's a way to promote American policies and making sure that we make new friends for the United States. So I would not be overly concerned. I mean, it's just the reality. We are in a difficult economic time. Times. Everybody's you know, tightening their belts here in America, which can impact some of our programs. But going forward, we do hope to continue to have the kind of productive exchanges, whether it's students and others, uh, that can keep our countries uh, closely linked together. In our conversations with the Central Asian young people, especially those in Uzbekistan, they seem to be very divided when it comes to their views on America, on American democracy. Some of them actually doubt that democracy itself may not be the best option for the region or for their countries. What do you say to them? Well, I tell them only what we've learned through our American experience, that people yearn for freedom of expression, freedom of the press, freedom now, in modern times, of the Internet. They want lively debates, they want to be able to express their views, and they also want the opportunity to pursue their own economic chances and, uh, and uh, possibilities. And so democracy is what has worked very well for the United States. We would love for them to come and experience our country and get a taste of what our freedom is about and so we can share that experience and we do so uh, I realize that other people may have different perspectives but my job and our job is to uh, promote and advance and share the American experience which I would say actually quite frankly these are universal rights I mean I've traveled around the world and almost everywhere I go people do want to be able to have the freedom of expression be able to say what's on their minds to have a debate and, a, and again a peaceful exchange of ideas 
when you spoke in Tashkent last week at a conference, um, you touched upon some really sensitive issues, things like transparency, you know, how much should public know and what should be the responsibilities and the kinds of freedoms that journalists should have. Um, those are topics that are not very widely discussed in, in both Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Isn't it hard to make it relevant for that public when you, when you speak about such things? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think that, again, as, as you pointed out, I did have an opportunity both in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan every day of my visit to talk about the importance of transparency in government, to share the American perspective, how the President Obama's administration has really tried to make itself much more accessible to the people. And when people are well informed, they can have more of a say in their future and they feel more responsible, a part of of the political life and society of a country. And so we share that experience. I think it resonates, quite frankly, when you talk to people that, the, you know, they start understanding that, yes, of course it makes sense. And the choice should be theirs. I mean, if they don't want to go on a government website to find out about some law or some new decree, that's their choice. But the government has a responsibility to inform its population of its policies so that they can then have a good judgment in terms of determining what the best future is for their country. Some activists on the ground would like U.S. government social media to address critical issues sometimes. They think that, uh, you know, while you're on Facebook or on Twitter, you're not really talking about the main problems. You're trying to engage them, but you're not necessarily uh, addressing the critical issues that people are facing on a daily basis. I can assure you that when we have discussions with the government, we raise human rights issues, we raise press freedom issues like I did, we raise cases of specific journalists who may have been detained or jailed or under threat. And so these issues are very much discussed. And in, frankly, in this visit that I just had, uh, talked about all these issues on, you know, with student groups, on interviews on TV, uh, also with the government itself and so we are very much engaging so it's not only a social media phenomenon where we want to engage and theoretically talk about these things no we get into very practical issues and concern that the US government uh, it thinks are important and to advance our common agenda and it, we don't do it only specifically with Central Asia I have to say from my experience I've traveled to countries like Honduras Uganda Mongolia and had similar presentations and discussions in those countries and to what extent would you say these efforts are bearing fruit, some concrete results? I mean, that's the challenge. And I did have an opportunity to have a discussion with uh, Uzbek government officials. And we talked about some of the laws that they're trying to uh, pass and, and put in place. And we did talk about how important it is not just to pass laws, but then to implement them, to actually yield the kind of results that the people would want to see. And so that may take some time, and we will certainly be tracking that, but it's very important that it doesn't just be things that you know, people can point to, oh, we passed some law, but rather that it actually has a net benefit for the citizens. What kind of feedback did you get from the public, you know, those people who listened to your speech? It seemed to me that the older generation of folks that I engaged with were a little more skeptical. It seemed the youth was very receptive and excited and they certainly welcomed me very warmly and were excited to hear about the United States and our perspective. And again, so maybe there's a little bit of a generational gap. Maybe there's, again, a little bit of apprehension. They don't know enough about the United States after, you know, so many years uh, of previous, you know, being under the Soviet Union and then 20 years now of independence. So maybe it hasn't given them a full feel of what the United States is about. And that's what we want the Uzbek people to really understand what we're about, that we want a partnership, a friendship, and we want to have good relations and that, you know, together we can accomplish, you know, common interests for our people. What surprised you most about the young people in the region? I've found when I've traveled around the world that when you meet with children and young adults, there's a common sort of optimism and happiness and, and dreams about their future. And that's wonderful to see that there are really some shared values. They're interested in music. And Tajikistan, I did a presentation about sports. And there was a lot of excitement about comparing how sports are in America to local sports. So there is really much a, a commonality. And I guess what surprised me, and I mentioned this, I participated in one session in uh, Samarkand and then another one in Bukhara. And all of a sudden realizing that, you know, you could be in some ways in an American classroom at the universities where some of these issues are being debated. They were debating about, you know, the value of the Internet, the pros and cons, some of the bad things that happen on the Internet, but then some of the good things. And that's the kind of same discussion we have here in America at our universities, at our schools. We hear a lot about people-to-people -people engagement here in Washington. What does that mean when, when, when they say people-to-people -people engagement? Are you talking about connecting ordinary Americans with ordinary Uzbeks, for example, or are we talking about 
bigger exchange programs? Well, people to people is a way of making sure that uh, people learn about each other. We have found that through our experiences that when people have an opportunity to exchange views, learn about each other's histories, cultures, traditions, that there's greater understanding. So even if there are disagreements about a U.S. government policy or about some action that's been undertaken, at the people level, they see that there's commonality of foods and sometimes they're uh, just interested in connecting and that helps to promote mutual understanding and really better relations. And so we want to have programs that allow our citizens to travel to Uzbekistan and of course uh, to attract uh, Uzbeks to come to the United States and study and learn about our democracy, our society. What kind of a response are you getting from the Uzbek government when you, when you say this? When you it say was, that we want to have more programs? I have to say I was well received by the government. We certainly, they listened uh, to our interests and our programs and what we'd like to do. They were quite receptive and then we'll just see if there's more follow-up. But they seemed very much inclined to explore some of these uh, potential, you know, greater exchanges and linkages so that we can have a, t a, a better relationship and better understanding of each other's, you know, cultures and, and, uh, and histories. Would you say that Washington will remain actively involved in the region post 2014, especially when it comes to public diplomacy, to cultural exchanges, no, engagement. Absolutely, and in fact, after 2014, we're going to be uh, continue to be engaged in Afghanistan, and we still will have security issues. You know, obviously fighting terrorism, combating narcotics, but the public diplomacy piece of educational and cultural exchanges will remain important in the region. What we hear a lot in the region is that, well, you know, after the United States is done in Afghanistan or will, you know, take most of its forces out of the country, they may not be this much American interest. No, we will continue to, to be interested. I know that there are plans. I was talking to our team, Ambassador Kroll's team in Tashkent about some of the programs they want to expand. And these are long-term efforts. And so we definitely want to reach out. We will be certainly looking to continue this well beyond 2014. Thank you so much. Sure, you're welcome.